Welcome to Bergen Forest Monastery's live stream. I am Ajahn Sona, and feel free to submit questions in the question bar. Um, let's begin with the first one, Pia. Our first question today, Ajahn, is from the live stream from Soren in Wisconsin, United States. Hello, Ajahn. Thank you for your continued inspiration and guidance. Question. There are some bhikkhus who teach that jhana is a state completely divorced from the five senses. What is your take on this? Well, that is one of the classic uh, phrases that is used in uh, in describing the uh, the first jhana as well. One <clears throat> uh, withdraws from the senses, the five senses. There are six senses in Buddhism. And the sixth one is the mind, but the senses of eye, ear, nose, tongue, and body, one withdraws uh, one's attention from those to focus inward. Uh, this is for the practice of jhana. There is uh, what happens, though, is that if one attains to the jhana or deep serenity, concentration. Um, there's an after effect. <clears throat> One must eventually emerge from uh, the experience, kind of like coming out of a movie. You know, you go to a movie theater and uh, you're engulfed in a movie for two hours and then suddenly you come back out onto the the sidewalks and you're walking around, you, mm. you're still, your consciousness is still lagging behind. If it was a, a romance or a comedy, every, you come out of there and perhaps everything's funny or <clears throat> uh, romantic, or if it was a tragedy, everything's tragic, uh, etc. So there's a secondary effects of, of samadhi, coming out of samadhi. Now, there's an afterglow, kind of an after effect of samadhi. And it is uh, it is uh, very pleasant, and the sensory world does not uh, impinge uh, very much. It, it's your it is faded into the background, but you're now walking around with your eyes and ears open. <clears throat> but in the in the uh, the depths of your concentration, the the world of sights, sounds, smells, tastes, and touches disappears. In the first jhana, there still can be uh, imaginative structures going on. We call vitaka and vichara. Um, some of the themes of, that arrive in the first jhana are contemplative features, such as the 32 parts of the body, uh, loving kindness inductions, which uh, require you to imagine beings, etc., things like that. Uh, so it's not until the second jhana where the uh, thinking uh, process uh, drops away and there's just a stillness of being. <clears throat> so more or less, that's the that's true that the out, there is withdrawal from the outer five senses, yeah. Our next question is from Paul in Guildford, Surrey, UK. Dear Ajahn, I have been digging into the original Pali of the suttas, and there are three Pali words which get translated by the English word, quote, mind. These words are citta, mano, and vijnana. Is it important to know the nuance of which Pali word is being used, or is it sufficient to judge the nuances of the English word from its context? Um, vinyana is kind of specific. It's usually meant as consciousness. Mano is mind. Uh, and that means more general processes of the mind involving perception and volitions, etc., also, the citta, <clears throat> it can be very uh, specific, but usually that's in the, what is called Abhidhamma. But uh, 
chitta and uh, mano are sometimes just general words generally for the mind. Remember that the words that the Buddha is using are drawn from the gen general usage in society. He is using the language of the people. <clears throat> He's sometimes re defining words, such the words like kama or karma. By the way, he, he probably would have said kama, K-A-M-M-A, rather than karma. Karma is the Sanskrit. Kama is the magada or the Pali, the prakrit, the, the vernacular of the, of the area that the Buddha is in. Uh, but he, he would care, more carefully define these words. Now, if he's talking to a general audience, he probably doesn't get, it's like a neurologist talking to a general audience. He doesn't want to baffle them. He wants to communicate. So he would use, you know, these, these terms for the mind are, are pretty general. But he, when he's very specific, uh, when he's looking into the aspects of what makes a human, what we call the five khandas, five heaps that comprise a human, one of them is vijnana, consciousness. By the way, this is a very hot topic these days by, for neurologists and philosophers, the study of consciousness, consciousness philosophy. What is consciousness? Etc. So, yes, there are distinction, distinctions in the way the word is used, and uh, a good consistent translator like uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi will attempt to observe uh, the distinctions. And when it's a, a, a certain subtlety or rare case, he, he will always put footnotes in the translations as well, saying that this specific or Sometimes you'll find in the suttas that vijnana is used in a, in a less specific way <clears throat> or it has larger meaning than, than the precise meaning, uh, this kind of thing. But usually it'll be accompanied by a, a footnote. And that's why you want to read good translations uh, by very knowledgeable people. Bhikkhu Bodhi is, uh, I highly recommend uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi's translations in general, yes. Next question is from the live stream from Franks in Canada. Dear Ajahn, is charging for your books coherent with Buddhism's generosity and universal access, considering scarce libraries? Might a free Kindle version better represent Dhamma's spirit of sharing? Yes, we, we have to uh, question ourselves about all of this. And uh, we do. <laughs> so... What we did, in fact, is make uh, the Kindle free um, for a period of time. We're dealing, we'd, what we decided to do was go through Amazon. Instead of printing a book on our own or having, there are systems within the Sangha, various publishers and printers and so forth who, who do this for the Sangha. And sometimes, uh, remember, all, all the, the free books which are made available are actually not free. They're paid for by somebody. So they're usually, they're usually subsidized by some generous donor. He, they might sponsor a thousand books. And then you, you, you're, you come to a monastery and they say, would you like a book? And they're free. So you take this so-called free book away. What, what is meant at the time of the Buddha is the Dhamma, the teachings are free. So the monk doesn't charge for his teachings and I don't charge for my teachings. I teach uh, verbally usually. And so that the actual original teachings we put on, on YouTube and podcasts and they're free and accessible anywhere in the world, anytime, day or night. Amazing. <clears throat> and they get widespread listeners. This is, I, I'm not interested in keeping this a secret. I want people to hear this stuff, but I, and, but I, and I also want them to voluntarily hear this stuff. We're not, we're not missionaries. We're not uh, confronting people on, this, on the street or knocking on doors saying, uh, have you heard the good news? <laughs> Doesn't work that way. Uh, we make it available 
Um, and it is available free in a, a number of different forms. But what, at the time of the Buddha, there weren't, wasn't any writing and there were no, was no paper. And so paper is, is a material stuff that costs money. You, you, it, I don't know why monks would be providing lay people with free paper. <laughs> we, we'll, we're happy to provide free dhamma which is priceless, <laughs> but there's paper <laughs> involved and postage and things like this. So somebody has to pay for this because bhikkhus don't have any money and they don't have paper. <laughs> so the, that distri distribution structure, uh, people like Amazon or even uh, uh, nonprofit printing places like Wisdom Publications, mm -hmm. They they don't do it for free. They have to have they have to pay their editors. They have rent, the cost of paper and printing, and distribution, etc. And then what they do is, if there's any profit, they reinvest it in the nonprofit society, and it's specifically a nonprofit. So uh, Birkin Monastery is a charitable society, tax-free charitable society, and the people who um, work at these things with me are actually, many of them are stewards who actually live in the monastery, but they don't get paid. And they, they are usually quite qualified people. They could make a good living out in the world, but they have chosen to stay here. Uh, we, the, the people who support Birkin are providing food for them and accommodation. Uh, and they do all this work for free. Um, and then, but we really want people to read it. We don't want to hide it under a, under a stone, you know. So we try to make it available. As I say, the Kindle version, they, they have a situation where they allow uh, five days out of 90 uh, Amazon to have a free uh, offering of it, which we take advantage of. So... I think 500 uh, copies of the re most recent book. This is the most recent book. Uh, what's it called? <laughs> what Comes Before Mindfulness? <laughs> what's the subtitle? Effective Effort, How to Garden Your Inner Life. Mm -hmm. This is the, la the most recent book on, uh, that we put up on Amazon. There's a Kindle version of this. And when we put up the Kindle version, we, we, they allowed us to do for three days uh, free and uh, 500 of them got downloaded in three days. Uh, the paperback is not free and the hardcover is not free um, because it's, it's, it's a thing and uh, it just can't be, it doesn't, not manifest it out of the air. But this that you're listening to right now, although there's like, there's two people back there with microphones and computers. There's two cameras in this room. There's lighting. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars worth of equipment. There's a whole building uh, to this and it's free. So we keep it on YouTube and we make sure that there's no monetization of YouTube. So uh, if you allow ads on your channel, uh, you can get money, but we don't. We don't want ads on our channel, so it's absolutely free, and we don't monetize it. But this, of course, is not free. Um, there's tens of hundreds of hours of human labor involved. Somebody's doing something, contributing their time, their labor, and all this equipment in order for this to appear. So it's nothing is really free. It's somebody, some, somebody subsidizes something so that you can have it for free. <laughs> That's how it all works. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. On to the next question. The next question is from Upasaka Abaya in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, United States. Dear Venerable Longpur, Discussing gratitude for our parents and teachers, Venerable Ajahn Liam said our parents and our teachers are, quote, the true devas illuminating our lives. Thank you so much. You are truly of veneration. Please share a lesson or experience you had with one of your teachers. 
Well, especially in your early days as a um, approaching the monastic life, uh, because you don't just instantly become a monk. Your your teacher has your monastic teacher, uh, and not all teachers are monastics. So there are lay teachers as well. They 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 meet you when you're a lay person, and they uh, they evaluate you and encourage you and correct you and uh, share with you along the way as a lay person. There are, in fact, it's a continuous stream of gifts, actually. They share their time and, and their consideration. Uh, and then you're watching them as well, how they do things. And that is a continuous uh, gift or teaching. You're, you're learning from their attitudes, really. So it's not just a simple little event, but there may be. Um, and then you become a monk. And I trained with uh, Bhante Gunaratana, uh, uh, a Sri Lankan monk, a very uh, esteemed uh, Sri Lankan monk who had opened the first uh, forest monastery in the United States. <clears throat> and uh, he was a continuous example to me, a, a person of endless determination and energy, and of course, very bright. He had a doctoral uh, level, uh, doctoral uh, <laughs> PhD in philosophy, as well as uh, a lifetime in the robes, and quite imp very, very impressive in terms of his uh, continuous dwelling within the Dhamma, you know. And, uh, you know, he's from Sri Lanka, born in the in 1927, I believe. And you can imagine uh, the shift of cultures that he would have had to deal with in, in coming to the United States and the fact that he was actually willing to put up with us. <laughs> you know, he arrived in the 60s when the Americans were right out of their minds. <laughs> a lot of young people showed up. You know, this the whole hippie movement, the whole whatever was happening in the 60s was, for some reason, Buddhism came up as a kind of a, a an interest of the counterculture. So you can imagine orthodox uh, Buddhist monks who had been in the robes since childhood in, in Asian countries in a totally different mindscape uh, having to deal with these young savages that uh, would show up. And he did it with uh, great compassion. And uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm just so impressed. Uh, and then I went to uh, Thailand and uh, seeing the behavior of the Thai monks is very impressive as well. But actually the Western monks uh, in Thailand were uh, very impressive. My first teacher there was Ajahn Pasano, who happens to be Canadian. And uh, he uh, was very impressive in terms of just like, it, it's a very austere life. It, you know, you're up at three or even earlier every single morning. You're doing all night sittings once a week. The abbot of the monastery has all kinds of duties. And to maintain your equanimity and to keep teaching and lead the monastery is an enormous demand on character. And uh, so I saw Ajahn Pasano uh, just maintain that under so many different circumstances, including being very, very ill with uh, two strains of malaria <laughs> at once and still have, still trying to run the monastery while you're in the midst of a malaria attacks. Um, and being very patient and at the same time being patient, but also being very clear about the standards that these young Westerners who were showing up there for training had to also rise to. It's tremendous discipline. Um, there is nothing quite like it in, uh, I well, sort of ultra marathoners or something like that lead, lead a life maybe similar to... Uh, into monastics, you know, it, it's it's an extraordinary 
24 hour a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, you're a, mon a monk and there's a demand on you. And the abbot has to keep the atmosphere up and all these things. So these, these teachers uh, were, are very remarkable. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't re really think that we have properly appreciated these characters uh, and what it takes. So, yeah, these are, these are remarkable uh, characters. You know, uh, people's uh, stories of their parents as well, uh, the things that parents do for their kids, and, and also under great difficulties, um, are, are astonishing. Uh, you, you hear these days, you know, single mother taking care of two or three kids and working two or three jobs at once. And uh, people grow up and they remember their mother and they, they, if they make it in life, they, the first thing they do is they go buy their mother a house, <laughs> make sure that they're kept well, because uh, they realize only when they grow up that what they, what they owe their parents, you see. Um, and you'll see many of these stories. So this is, this is an act of love, but it's also an act of courage and determination. Uh, which these are the characteristics that you find in, in the people who, who are willing to teach you. Um, by the way, I, as an abbot, I, I, did, I have given uh, what's called dependence or ordination to, uh, I think, six monks. But I don't give ordination or dependence anymore because it's too much work. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I send them to Ajahn Pasano <laughs> or other senior monks because they're still willing to do it. It's tremendous burden. I, I, uh, my sharing now is is through uh, mostly teaching lay people, doing things like this, uh, this uh, <clears throat> question and answer, and uh, writing books and and uh, and uh, living in a, and developing a monastery, the physics of a monastery, and so forth. Uh, but it is a tremendous, uh, it is a tremendous responsibility and demand. Um, if anybody wants to step into the role of abbot, uh, good luck to them. Um, and uh, they, almost all of them, deserve great uh, admiration for their efforts. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Next question. The next question is from the live stream from Alyssa in South Florida. I have heard people mention praying to devas. Is this a practice in the Thai forest tradition? Well, uh, sometimes the the, wor the English words that are used, especially by Asians, uh, they pick up words. Uh, you know, I, I find the Sri Lankans calling monks priests and so forth. They, they're borrowing English words. Well, even the word monk is a borrowed word from Latin. I mean, um, mono, or is it Greek? I forget. Um, Monk is uh, monakos, yeah, Greek, monakos, meaning one who lives alone, a soloist. And uh, we, we are not monks, we are bhikkhus, and we are also samanas, uh, we're alms mendicants. We do, uh, we do uh, exalt the solitary life, uh, but uh, uh, this is just borrowed language. So when we use the word pray, what does it even mean? Who knows? It's, it's such a wide blanket term, pray to the devas. There is an, there is an encouragement to uh, re remember the devas or uh, recollection of the devas. Uh, so it's it's like recalling illness, aging, death, Dhamma uh, the Buddha, Buddha Nusati, B Buddha, the Buddha, and Nusati. Sati means uh, recollection. Uh, it also means mi what we call mindfulness. Now again, we're borrowing an English word, mindfulness, for Sati. Uh, sati is the word. The seventh factor of the Eightfold Path is. Sama sati, or right mindfulness, uh, or right recollection, and so there is specifically something called da, uh, uh, deva nusati, recollection of the. We 
we might call them angels, but they're not angels. Uh, again, we have two totally different traditions. In the Christian, in the Jewish, uh, and inheriting into the Christian tradition, the, these angels, uh, they have a very vague background. How, who, who are these angels, and where are they from, etc.? They seem to have been uh, just with God or something in heaven or God, they are creations of God or whatever. Uh, in Buddhism, these devas, by the way, this deva, this word deva is very close to the word deus, uh, which is a word for God, deus, deva, deus. Um, the Latin, Greek, and Pali and Sanskrit are all connected languages, have similar common roots as well. And the concepts are all floating around in the different languages. The devas in the Buddha, uh, in the, from a Buddhist point of view, have uh, arrived there from some place. And uh, one of the places you arrive there is from human existence. When you die, you you one can become a deva, uh, a, de a sort of a, an angelic being. Again, we, I'm groping for words because I have to borrow from the English language. These devas are not particularly interested in humans. <laughs> uh, there's all kinds of interesting descriptions of this. The, cos the descriptions of heaven are, in Buddhism are extremely precise, and full of detail. Uh, it seems that people with special psychic capacity, such as the Buddha and, and others, uh, can see into this realm and, in, in fact, visit this realm, and, and that realm can visit this realm. Devas appear and talk to the Buddha, ask questions of the Buddha frequently. Um, there are, there are bo whole books of descriptions of the, the realms that they live in. There is a book uh, called uh, Bra the uh, Ma Mansions of the Devas, uh, the, what is it? Do you remember the name? The Bra yeah, the, De the Vihara something. Right. Ka 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 There's the Petavatu and the De uh, not the Devava to the something, anyway. <laughs> the English would be the mansions of heaven. I mean, uh, a translation. Um, yeah, so this, the, uh, it said that Mogalana, Venerable Mogalana, Vimana Vatu, the Vimana, the Vimana is a, is a, is a dwelling. Uh, and Vatu is the place, the place of the of the Deva's dwelling, realm kind of thing. It's a fascinating little book, and it's found in the last collection, the Kudaka Nikaya of the Pali Canon. And Venerable Mogalana visits there because he's got psychic powers, and he describes, he talks to the Devas, and he describes them. They're absolutely unbelievably beautiful, radiant with light, uh, shining, beautiful, of you beautiful dimensions. There's no aging signs there. There's no sickness. And they live in these kind of mobile palaces that float and radiate colors. And there's levels of the Deva realms. It's uh, these incredible, exquisite details. You know, in, in uh, Christianity, uh, certainly in the New Testament, they're just devoid of any details about the nature of heaven. Um, and uh, although uh, it's very interesting that Christ apparently says, in my Father's house are many mansions, that, that's all he says. <laughs> um, <clears throat> this is, uh, they're not interested. They, their lifespans are very, very, very long. Uh, in Christianity, uh, heaven is supposed to be some eternal, but in Buddhism, although it's exquisitely described and visited regularly, 
it is known that it, the lifespans are limited, uh, limited to millions of years, actually, or billions of years, but limited. And uh, so they are really not concerned with these, the tiny time spans of human existence. Sometimes we people are praying to the devas, you know, they they have an illness or some bad thing is happening in their life, but from the deva point of view, this life is just so small. It's like the lifetime of a mosquito. Notice that we have we have hospitals for cats and dogs and horses and but we don't have any insect hospitals. Mm -hmm. I gotta start a chain of insect hospitals <laughs> where mosquitoes with broken legs are brought, you know. And <laughs> You know, why wouldn't we do that? Why don't we have insect hospitals? Hey, their lives are just so short, ephemeral. Um, we just, we don't have time to be concerned with it. So the devas, the angelic beings, are not concerned too much with the human level. By the way, the human, uh, however beautiful it can be on in human life in terms of... Uh, billionaire, uh, you know, yachts and things like this. It's still um, basically a garbage heap uh, from the point of view of the, where the Davis live. <laughs> it's a dark and stinky place. <laughs> it's, uh, it's the best house in the ghetto kind of thing. <laughs> bad, bad news. Um, so this is the, the, how, the, how Buddhism conceives of the Davis and so forth. So we're not doing a lot of praying to the devas, but re recollecting more or less your own deva nature, your own possibilities of uh, you achieve, uh, you, you at death, you go there because of your generosity, your kindness, um, your virtue. That is the, what, the kind of consciousness that gets you to the deva realm. It's not by joining a club or getting baptized or any of these external rituals. They, they have no effect whatsoever. It is it is your consciousness. You're, you, you are either devic consciousness, you are either angelically uh, conscious, or, or you're not. And then you can't join a club that sends you to heaven. It's like a person who has got very bad manners, who is sent to a ver really sophisticated uh, party. You're just, you would be just completely out of place. If, you, if your consciousness is not devic, then you're you're out of place in heaven. <laughs> There's no point in you being there. <laughs> it's like taking a dog to an art gallery. You know, it's, <laughs> it's the dog doesn't see art; they just smell oil paint. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's move on from the Deva realm. <laughs> Next question is from Alexandra in Brooktondale, New York, United States. I recently watched a video about conditions on an 18th-century transatlantic slave ship. Seeing these hellish quarters was deeply disturbing and left me overwhelmed with grief. I know Karuna is a Brahma Vihara, and yet when I feel compassion, I also feel immense, even debilitating grief for the object of this compassion. How can I learn to experience Karuna without also succumbing to sympathetic grief? Yeah, I want to unpack some of these terms for the general audience. So Karuna is... Uh the name for compassion. It's the Pali word for compassion. And I think Brahma Viharas came up. This is the one of the emotions that uh, is shared by the, the angelic beings, the devas uh, in the Brahma realms. The, the Brahma realms are, are the realms of the, these, of these devas. Um, so you get there, you can get there by attitudes. So one of the, the first attitude is a loving kind, universal loving kindness. So this is um, something you can enter, you can experience the deva realms here and now on, in this life by entering into a grand state of loving kindness. Uh, because the beauty trends, you know, the delicate beauty of loving kindness exceeds the the mere mat material beauty of the of the senses, right? So, and then the second one is is a subcategory of loving kindness. It's called compassion. And what is that? 
In the West, quite often compassion is confused with a sympathetic grief. You're, you're weeping with, you're grieving, you're feeling their pain, you know, you're, you're sharing their pain. But the, thank goodness the Buddha is very clear about this. this it's just, that's another form of suffering, which is very problematic because there's always somebody in dire straits, very difficult suffering conditions. So if you're very compassionate, you will always, all, you will be taking on the suffering of everybody and there's no way out. So the, of course, uh, Buddhism is all about coming to the end of suffering. So how do you come to the end of suffering while everybody else is experiencing it? You, your compassion is, is simply a form of loving kindness for those who are suffering. And loving kindness is not a form of suffering. So you, and it's actually a very beautiful, heartfelt experience. It's love. And you are directing your loving kindness. Sometimes your actions will follow that. Sometimes the, the, there's no way to. So you're, you're seeing this documentary on slave ships and the terrible things they did to people. Uh, we, 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 uh, if you look at human history, it's, it's very easy to find endless uh, cruelty and uh, torture and suffering and so forth. And uh, when you look at this thing, you, you need to look at it with loving kindness, uh, but not with not grief and horror, um, because you are now adding to the cruelty of the planet because uh, that kind of grief and sorrow is is a form of self torment, isn't it? You are now also suffering. There's enough suffering in the world, isn't there? Do you want to add to it, or do you want to take subtract from it? <laughs> you want to add to the suffering? So this is the question you must ask when you when you plunge into sympathetic grief. You say, now now what have I just done? Now there's one more person suffering in the world. I thought I wanted less suffering. So how about if I start with myself and say, okay, enough with the suffering. It's not necessary for me to suffer here. I don't need to inflict this suffering. Uh, somebody else is experiencing pain. My body is not in pain. May they be well, and maybe I can even give them some medicine or I can train as a doctor to alleviate pain or something like this. That would be a sensible response to this. Uh, if, if a person is in mental pain and you can, you can learn Dhamma, you can be a, a therapist or a psychologist and uh, talk in ways which would alleviate their uh, suffering. Or you become a monk or a nun. And so we, that's what we do. Uh, if we're teaching monks or nuns, uh, we would be teaching people how not to suffer, how to alleviate their suffering in their various situations. We're not uh, physical doctors. We're most definitely not treating people with medicines and uh, giving them advice about uh, health and so forth. We, we're, we're dealing with the mind. So that's, that's an act of compassion. Uh, loving kindness wants you, makes you want to share teachings which alleviate people's distress. So this is the proper uh, use of loving kindness. This is very poorly understood in the West, and I, I endlessly explain this: um, that compassion is not sympathetic grief; it is uh, it is loving kindness for those who are suffering. Maybe that's my next book. Oh goodness! Okay, yeah. <laughs> next question is from Emmy in Chiang Mai, Thailand. Ajahn, I've attended 10-day retreats in the past, and now I'm ready to commit to a month-long retreat. There's plenty of Vipassana schools to choose from, but I am struggling to find one that focuses on samadhi. Would you recommend training in the Pau Ak method for this reason? Well, sometimes I have trouble recommending uh, retreats and this school and that school, you know. I'd, partly because I don't know the details of every school, but some of them I have practiced in some of these schools and uh, taken these courses and 
read some of the uh, instructions and so forth. And I, I'm from a different school. I'm from a more generalist, naturalist school, um, which uses, first of all, sees that the Buddha teaches in many ways to many different people, and that there's a lot of careful tailoring of teachings to the individual. And when you have a school where you hand out the same technique to everybody, that's a, that's a call, I call it a silver bullet uh, school. One silver bullet to, deals with everything. Uh, the, why then does the Buddha have so many diverse teachings and, and for different people in different situations? So there, uh, really the Dhamma is not a, it's not a systemized technique. It's, it, hopefully you meet people who are wise and have a depth of experience that can give you particular advice for particular times in your life and addressing your particular configuration of personality. So that, that's the ideal situation to, to be in. Um, I sometimes do give uh, longer length uh, samadhi retreats in uh, at Birkin uh, <laughs> before the COVID thing. I think that last, uh, just before COVID hit in what was it, May 2020? Was it April. April 2020? That's, we were in a, lo a lengthy uh, samadhi retreat. What was it? Was it a month long one or t two weeks, three weeks? Yeah. Two week uh, jhana retreat. And um, so I've experimented with uh, up to a month long retreats for, for lay people in, in Samadhi. But uh, each person, uh, first of all, it's a limited number of people. You can only, as a teacher, you can only deal with a, a certain amount of individuals, maybe a dozen, 15, um, if you want to give individual cons consultations and um, uh, the special situations. It's a very special atmosphere, and and uh, it's not a it's not a one size fits all. It just isn't. Uh, there are no, there is no just this technique. You know, there's a number of suggestions, but different people. Some people are uh, have been traumatized, and some people are very healthy, and some people are frustrated, and they don't have good attention spans, and on and on it goes. So this idea of recommending a school or a silver bullet technique, I, I just can't, you know. Mm. Here's something I recommend is uh, I gave six talks during that jhana course. It was a six, I think. And it's on the YouTube channel. So take my course <laughs> on the YouTube channel. And it's primarily a, a wide-ranging discussion of the Buddha's directly his, his teachings and the similes he uses and some of the examples that he gives in teaching uh, and advocating jhana to his disciples and a number of different approaches to it. So there you go. Uh, find yourself a good situation where you're not distracted or burdened uh, and spend a few weeks uh, perhaps uh, cultivating your practice and listening to uh, these dhamma talks on, on jhana. I mean, there are many more by me, uh, uh, but those are like six exclusively just on jhana and a, an example of, of a two-week uh, jhana retreat. Yeah. Okay, let's go on. The next question is from the live stream from Tesfe. Hello, my question is on dealing with pain. I have a disease and have been dealing with the loss of mobility. I feel unworthy. I want to learn how to not suffer anymore and let go. Please guide me. You feel unworthy. And I, that, it's a bit vague. So you feel unworthy because you are sick and in pain? Well, certainly you shouldn't feel unworthy. Uh, the What's happening is is normal. You are in a state of normality. Everything's just uh, normal and that is fully expected. There isn't, there isn't a tragedy going on here. There's no 
a special condition, actually the opposite. You are experiencing the norm. To have a body is to potentially suffer. It's full of uh, nerve endings and uh, it is so complex that, and it's in the midst of, a, of an environment full of hostile <laughs> forces. <laughs> and uh, the, the strangeness is when it's not sick. <laughs> That's a very unusual and temporary condition to be healthy. <laughs> uh, so you're in a, you're, first of all, you normalize the situation. Yeah, nothing strange is happening. Everything's normal and I'm normal. And the fact that it's causing me distress is absolutely normal as well. And this is why the Buddha talks about those who can not suffer when in physical distress and having illnesses are super normal. They're above normal, and that's what we aspire to. The body always has to stay normal. Even the Buddha had physical pain. Uh, near the end of his life, he had a bad back, and he, he had pain uh, quite a bit. And it was only when he was in deep samadhi that he didn't have pain in his body. He died uh, after having days of dysentery, uh, you know, a very undignified type of uh, illness. Uh, your stomach is racked with convulsions and diarrhea and all this kind of stuff. So the Buddha is subject to this as well. But what he said is, I'm, my mind, you know, I train my mind not to associate, so identify with this body, because uh, the body is a, is a, a, a basket of illnesses. And you're condemned to live with this thing. It's quite a, it's a, we have to get very realistic about it. You know, health is more or less a, an unusual state and uh, sickness is more of the normal state. <laughs> and we, we, we must uh, transcend the body, you know, our condition of the body. So, yeah, you know, this is what happens when you're born and you just, you, you get into a body and that, that's it. You know, it's, it's a rickety, uh, leaky boat and then it goes down. It all, all of them sink in the end. <laughs> and uh, not to be very somewhat dismissive. Ah, well, it's just it's, uh, you know, nerve endings going off and pain and this and that. Eh, well, what what else do I expect? Uh, this is the this is the the fate of humans. <clears throat> so we we say, but I I need to realize that I really can change my mood, and it doesn't mean that I. What, because I'm hoping I will get better, it means that I, I decide now to be better. Uh, I decide now to be better in my mind, my emotions, and that I'm not going to let uh, my bodily condition dictate my emotions. I simply, uh, it'd be foolish to do so. The wise don't do that. So that's the attitude. By the way, so I have another book called uh, uh, Life is the Game, no, Life... Uh, Life is a near-death experience. I have to consult my uh, Lord knows. <clears throat> um, these are my editors as well as the video people. Uh, they also edit my books and so forth. So life is a near-death experience. <laughs> it's on Amazon. <laughs> There's three books now on Amazon. There's Life is a Near-Death Experience, uh, Bloom, and this one, uh, what comes before mindfulness? Uh, and they all have advice about, a whole books of advice about these things like sickness, uh, aging, death, uh, all of these things. So, uh, yeah, I recommend that you take a look at that book. Yeah. Okay. Next question, Pia. The next question is from the live stream from Adam in Moscow, Eastern Europe. Dear Ajahn, my question regards the conditioned nature of gender, sexual identities, and bodies. Since discovering that I don't feel an attachment to any particular gender, sex identification, and science doesn't point to any racial or sexual gender essence in the minds or bodies, would you say that segregating people in lay or monastic spaces is unnecessary, just as racial segregation is unnecessary? <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> this is like a chess game. Who's going who's gonna to lose their bishop in this game? 
nicely put. There's a nice uh, opening argument there, you know. Tie it in with racism. <laughs> well, uh, I appreciate your reasoning. Uh, and certainly racism, uh, there is no racial segregation. The Buddha is very clear, no racial segregation. Um, and there is no uh, discriminating based on caste. Of course, uh, India at the time, the, the Brahmin uh, structures were, had caste uh, structures and the Buddha cast, <laughs> cast them aside. He, he over, overthrew these arbitrary decisions. So people from the lowest caste came in and if they were senior, uh, somebody from the royal caste or even from the Brahmin caste would be the attendant of somebody who came from the, the lower caste, you know. It was strictly based on seniority. And things went along for a few years. Uh, it was all male, though. And then uh, his own relatives, his, his aunt who had raised him, you know, his mother had died early in his life, when he was only seven days old, his mother died, and his aunt, his mother's sister, raised him from a baby, and she's nursing, she's uh, breastfeeding him and everything, and so he grows up, he's now 30, he's almost 40, he's, he becomes the Buddha at 35, he, he, uh, he's 40 years old, and his aunt and some of his uh, ex relatives show up and they want to be nuns and they're not only that they're crying and making a fuss about it and he's just in a it's a he's looking around at the society at the time and saying oh my goodness you know women just there's going to be a problem with this social situation but he says you know this is going to be problems but I guess uh, we'll do it anyway so he's a, he's a social uh, rebel. He is really upset. Um, certainly the Brahmin caste, he has upset them. He has upset a lot of people. And he's going to even upset them more by having a woman's order. And this is, in history, this is so far ahead of its time. Um, he predicts that it, it, it'll reduce the the duration of the, the Sangha, but he's going to do it anyway. And then he has to deal with uh, gender issues because gender issues are a feature of the time as well. Uh, this is not new. I mean, somehow in the West, it's like, what? There are people some that are kind of neither gender? What the? <laughs> uh, Asia has a long history of, of special treatment and interesting attitudes to this. They, they recognize this in these cultures, um, and you see it regularly uh, described in the in the Buddhist teachings. Uh, people who are sort of hermaphrodite, um, who don't have distinctive gender or sexual features of either either sex, uh, and they have to deal with this. What about them? What about them? So they have some. Uh, they decide that. Women can become nuns, certain women, not every woman. By the way, so there's this, uh, it's not a, a, a social right to become a monk or a nun. There are all kinds of qualifications. It's almost like joining the army. There is, there are qualifications. You actually have to be uh, physically uh, complete. Uh, you can't have missing limbs, for instance. Now, this is shocking and somewhat to the modern times where in the Sangha, there is a, a clear notion that you can't be, can't be ordained if you have missing limbs or certain physical disabilities, certain long-term illnesses, uh, if, you're, if you don't have your faculties, if, you can't, if you're deaf, blind, uh, all these things uh, preclude you from being a, also uh, mental uh, disabilities. Um, the reason for this is they don't want the Sangha to become a dumping ground for pe people that, 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 that families don't want to take care of or that the society doesn't want to take care of. Oh, we'll send them off to the monastery. The monks will ha t 
take care of them. No, the monks are not there as running a rehab center or a hospital. They're not there for that purpose. And we should get that clear. This is not, we are not opening hospitals. We are not doctors and we are not special needs therapists at all. And so we, we have to get this clear. <clears throat> and the next level is uh, what to do with people who are indistinct in gender. Now, um, remember that the, why they have the nuns and the monks living separately is that this is a celibate order. So first thing the Buddha wants to make it not difficult for monks or nuns, but easy, not difficult for monks or nuns, but easy for monks and nuns. And for males to be away from being offensive, if a monk has sex with any other being, it's a disrobing offense. Instant disrobing, and you can never be a monk again in this life. It's that, That's how clear it is. Now, compare that with the Catholic Church. <laughs> Somehow, they are said to be have taken these vows of celibacy, and they they apparently don't follow it, and they don't get kicked out. Uh, but whereas Theravada monks who are following this, uh, any transgression of that sexual boundary is instant dismissal, and you can never return to the sangha at, after that. So if he sets it up, that's that. So he doesn't make it difficult. So this is why you're, you're separating the sexes. Now, somebody who's in the middle, in the gender thing, he's saying, well, there's a small portion of the population like this, but I'm, I'm favoring the dominant forms. I'm favoring the uh, male configuration to live in a community with each other. By the way, it is not uh, homosexual a per person who's homosexual is not dis not barred from becoming a monk. Or a woman who is lesbian is not barred from becoming a nun. That That's a mental attitude. Um, but the physical uh, characteristics are the basis for uh, discriminating in terms of who can enter the Sangha. So this is how they do it. So this is the... Um, this is, was set up in the 5th century BC. And uh, one has to, again, the discussion is open now, re reopened uh, with the gender thing. So in fact, we have meetings and abbot meetings and so forth. What, what should, how should we respond to this, etc.? cetera? Um, but we are bound by Vinaya. We don't really, this is one of the sayings is this is, not your sasana. In other words, monks are not are not the creators of the Buddha sasana. The Buddha is the creator of this. And the individual opinion about this is subject to the the rules of the Vinaya laid down by the Buddha. And so we have to consult with these. These are the constitution basically. And we can't override you you know an individual monk can't just override the Vinaya. You'll find Buddhist schools that are not actually Vinaya schools, and we wouldn't consider them necessarily monks. They're, they wear robes and so forth, and they're quite liberal in their how they restructure their situation, and that's all right. They can they can establish different orders as long as they don't presume that they're the part of this bhikkhu lineage, and they can be very liberal, um, etc. Uh, so that's another. Uh, form, but and this is part of why I do these these Q and A's is that to clarify some of these things that, that the order, the Theravada or the early Buddhist order, it has a vinaya, a rules, a constitution which have rules of conduct and so forth, and that the not all schools of Buddhism are are the same. And this is, we try to uh, stay within the structures of the early um, Buddhist uh, rules of conduct. And this is a, this happens to be the largest school of monastics on the planet. 
um, and it's the one that has endured longest, it's roughly referred to as the Theravada. Um, and it has a very strict set of uh, how, what makes you a monk, the ordination procedures, and whether you are validly a monk or not. And it's not something that you can just um, override by personal opinion or even a, an influential monk just say, oh, we, we do it a different way. So this is, this is how this works. So, uh, uh, checkmate. <laughs> okay, so we are, um, we are done for today. We will be back next week uh, with, um, oops, <laughs> we will be back next week uh, with, at the same time, 9 o'clock, uh, Pacific time, 9 a.m. Pacific time on the 31st of December. Yes. Yeah, I have three books. Uh, Life is a Near-Death Experience, Bloom, and this one, What Comes Before Mindfulness. Isn't that an intriguing question? Don't you want to find out what comes before mindfulness? So we leave that with you for today. <laughs>